Welcome to Liner Notes, a podcast about how scholars plan and stay organized and the tools they use. In each episode, I'll be interviewing a scholar about what's in their pen case or something akin to a pen case if they don't have one, how they plan their time, and their secrets to an organized scholarly life. I'm Catherine Jewell, a historian and professor of history at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. Our guest today is Joseph Edelman, who is an associate professor in the history department at Framingham State University in Framingham, Massachusetts, a sister school to my own Fitchburg State University in the same system. A historian of media, communications, and politics in the Atlantic world, he recently published his award-winning first book, Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing the News, 1763 to 1789. Uh, it's out with Johns Hopkins University Press. He's now at work on a history of the post office in America. He's presented and published broadly, including in the journals Enterprise and Society and Early American Studies. In 2019, Edelman was elected as a member of the American Antiquarian Society. He also serves as an assistant editor for digital initiatives at the Omaha Hundred Institute of Early American History and Culture, where he edits The Octo and is an assistant producer for the Ben Franklin's World podcast. Welcome, Joe. Welcome to Liner Notes. Thanks for having me, Kate. I'm, I'm excited to talk. So we're going to jump right into segment one, which is the what's in your pen case or akin to a pen case if you don't have one. I have a mug <laughs> on my desk, <laughs> not a pen case. Um, that could be one of your three things, right? If you're going to select three items to highlight for us, you can, you can, you can highlight your mug. Yeah, the mug isn't as important as, as what's in it. So yeah, what's in my pen case? Well, I'm holding it in my hand. So I have, um, I've been using this since college, so... A couple of decades that I keep coming back to the pilot, what is it, precise V5, so the very fine point um, pens that I have in black and blue um, mm -hmm. for writing and editing tasks. I keep coming back to those, I think, because I when I write, I both press down very hard with ballpoint pens and so end up with a like mess of paper. It looks like it's all embossed. Um, and have very tight mm -hmm. handwriting, so having a very fine point is important for me because otherwise it just looks smushy. When I take notes in books or on like journal articles that I printed off or things, I tend to use another, a fine point mechanical pencil for the same reason that otherwise I end up with this like really big thick underlining. And But for whatever reason, I, I, I write in my books, never in a library book, but in my books. <laughs> but I use pencil on those, I think because it feels somehow less damaging to a book than writing in pen, mm -hmm. even though I paid for it. <laughs> it's less transgressive. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> less transgressive, even though I paid for it either way. One of the things that's been funny during the pandemic is that I've gotten much more into, I don't have any near at hand, into the old, just old fashioned wooden pencils. Um, my first grader was required to get a box of 12 of them or something. That was what they wanted them to have for handwriting like for school. Ticonderoga. Yeah, Ticonderoga, number two pencils. Good old fashioned. I could go take the SAT or a, <laughs> or some other test with it. I don't know. There's something satisfying about it, about having that old fashioned thing. Also, I like to do crossword puzzles in the newspaper, and the mechanical pencils just rip right through the paper. Yeah. And so, do you find with the pilot because you're talking about like like kind of that hard writing, um, does it alleviate that for you, or is that just sort of like would moving to a fountain pen be like a good thing, or do you find that you kind of need to have that interaction with the paper like you need the paper to kind of like i really like when i've filled up a piece of paper and i'm outlining and it's got that kind of crinkly quality from like the ballpoint impressing into it mm -hmm. it feels like i've done something i don't know do you get that kind of sat that tactile satisfaction out of it or no um am i just weird maybe and we could talk about that later um but i don't get that as much i tend to get so if, I'm, if i have like a notebook or something and i'm writing with a ballpoint pen ballpoint I tend to push down so hard that there's an like imprints three pages down <laughs> and so it feels like I can never actually like the the crinkliness is satisfying in a way like I can relate to that um but it also I like the pilot pen like you can't press down because the ink just right as soon as you touch the paper the ink comes out and so mm -hmm. it just flows it just flows and you it gotta save your hand it saves my hand from yeah and then there's something I don't know if it's tactile or visual um or if it's just that I've gotten used to it over the years of the feel of it of the way it looks on the paper for me that that getting that same sort of feeling of satisfaction of filling up a page with that or taking um i love editing with my actually i edit with both the blue and the black we're going to talk about where i think this is part of question two but um <laughs> when i'm editing something of my own I'll, I'll print it out i want to work on hard copy 
Um, I'll have the blue pen, sometimes a pencil. It depends on what mood I'm in. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And then a like legal pad next to me that I, if I have something really long, if I need to add like three sentences in a spot, I'll pick up the black pen and go right on the um, legal pad with a number that then corresponds to where that goes in. But the rest is like marking it up with, and I love seeing the paper marked up with blue of inserts and moving words around and playing with the language. It's interesting how the pen, like when you have a sort of a consistent one that you use, it does become your voice on the page. And it's like, you're seeing your, yeah. your idea. I've had periods, the pilot pens are a little more expensive than like just a regular old ballpoint. And so I've had periods, especially like during grad school, right? When you're not, um, when making money is a joke rather than a thing you do, but I always come back to it. Cause it just like, that's my thing. That's what I come back to and what I feel most comfortable with. And yeah, like it looks like my handwriting looks more like my handwriting when it comes off of that pen. This all feels so dorky, but it's also true. <laughs> it is true. And, and that is something interesting about the handwriting and how your handwriting can actually change with different types of pens that I feel yeah, like when I'm using like the big, those big felt tip pens, like I write, like it looks more like, like that architectural script mm-hmm. where it's like kind of blocky and big. And that's like, if I want to have that voice, like um, it's like when I'm doing like big headlines or like the outline, the big ideas, and I want it to really stand out. Whereas if I'm just like brainstorming, like that sort of for me is like a different, a different tool, a different pen. It's almost like I need those different modes to kind of represent the different ways that I'm thinking about things. Well, I think, I think it's a good segue to, to question two, which is how do you organize your, your time and your work, especially, you know, you're a teacher, you have a four, four or three, 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 three yeah. 12 credit, 12 credits a semester. Yep. So technically we have the same load. <laughs> same hours yeah, anyway. Yeah. How, how do you go about making all of this work? Um, it's nice to know you think that it works. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is something that's changed a lot during the pandemic. Um, because my kids have been home. Um, so the, the district that we live in the, um, since last March, and as we're recording this, it's about 11 months. My two bigger kids have not been in a school building. And so they've been doing remote school that entire time. Um, and my three-year-old has been in and out of daycare, depending on all the various things that depend. Um, and even when she goes right now is only going for the mornings. What my wife and I have done, like just in organizing time is we split up the week pretty much exactly 50, 50 in terms of who's on kid coverage, who's on work time down in the basement and using class meeting times as sort of the, um, the starting point, obviously, cause we're, we're doing some synchronous classes. Um, she teaches too. Um, and so we have to make sure that those times are blocked off. And then, uh, you know, in some ways, the pandemic's been terrible, <laughs> just generally. And it's way cut down the amount of actual number of hours I've had available to work. Um, but I've started, and by started, I mean, it took me eight or nine months to like get to this point, but I'm finally getting to the point where it feels like I'm being much more deliberate about what I use, how I design my week and how I design what I'm doing my work for um, and when. So I've now got it for this semester where obviously I have class meetings and I have it basically like assigned for the day of the week. Like at my Wednesday general education class, I do that reading on Tuesday (laughs) and the class prep. And I just, Mm -hmm. I know I have to do it on Tuesday because I don't have time to do it on Monday and it's got to happen by Wednesday and right. Like it just has to fit in there and then slot all of that in. And that's, you know, just in terms of like the teaching work, that's a lot of the time, you know, I try to be mindful if I have a, a, If I'm on kid duty in the morning, the two big ones are in school. And so they're mostly independent. They need checking in on every once in a while. Um, You know, and so I'll try and make sure that during those times um, that I've got what I would call low brain activities or things that Mm -hmm. only take a few minutes, I can grade response papers because I can, if I get interrupted, I can go back and pick up the next one thing. And if I need to read something that goes in my work time, (laughs) because there's no Mm -hmm. way I'm going to actually read something. um, Yeah. When you need that, the uninterrupted yeah. thought. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it really took me until the start of this semester um, to feel like I've actually kind of got the hang of it. And I'm probably even making it sound like I have more of a hang of it than I actually do in practice. But yeah, like I know that I have today as we're recording, we're recording in the morning because that's my work time. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And so thank, thank you for taking I'm happy to. Your work I'm, it, 
<laughs> it's fun. Um, but right, the rest, the balance of the morning is stuff that I actually need to focus on. And then in the afternoon, I've got all the kids. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. especially because my three-year-old is home, um, you know, I probably won't get very much done, if at mm -hmm. all. I can check my email a couple points while she's distracted. You know, it's funny how the pandemic kind of bring has brought issues of work and parenting into sharper focus and some of the myths that often came up. Like, I remember a long time ago, there was some kind of workshop on campus about research time, and somebody said... You know, like, well, because I have a child, like, I really benefit from this flexible schedule. And I'm like, the, f the idea of, like, the flexible schedule is such a myth. <laughs> because, it, like, okay, sure, like, I don't have to, like, show up every day at the same time for, like, eight hours yeah. where I'm, like, away from this other space. Right. And there, there are things about that that can be leveraged and, and used but when you have all of these different types of activities, like they've got to go somewhere and it requires you to be much more deliberate in what types of tasks go when, Yeah. given where you are in that flex time. Right. And it's flexible, except when it's really not right. I've got my, my Monday, Wednesday class. I'm only doing one meeting per week. So they're only meeting on Wednesdays, but Wednesday at two 30, that's what I'm doing. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. <laughs> what else life thinks is going on i mean if i need to take a sick day right that's a different different issue but like that's locked in the whole that 15 weeks that nothing else can happen no meetings no anything and it's a time if it's a time when i'm teaching i need to make sure my wife is available to be on 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 lead kid duty and right vice versa that when during her teaching times i have to be have my schedule clear especially during the pandemic but in general you know i always had this sense that i'm like a cruise director yeah of like making sure like i know when everybody is in all of these different places like you have to kind of constantly monitor all of these moving parts and the chef for the buffet <laughs> there's never enough goldfish in the house <laughs> doesn't matter what you do or the right kind the two girls the younger two girls eat lunch at the same time but they never seem to want the same thing I can't make Never. two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I have to make one peanut butter and jelly sandwich and one other thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the sixth grader, he's on his own. He He's in charge of making his own lunch. But, um. <laughs> you know, I feel like my house just sort of spawns chaos. I mean, and I, I, I'm a pretty kind of cluttered person. Like, I work in a very cluttered fashion. But I find that it is kind of getting to me a lot more. Yeah. And that, you know, why am I doing a podcast about organizations? Because I feel like I don't <laughs> feel have like haven't, Yeah. And we have, I don't know what it's like at your house, but we have um, the workspaces and play spaces tend to overlap a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in our office space. This was a total coincidence. Last January, we decided to switch around. Um, we have like a den off our dining room that had been an office space that we just decided at that point, let's move the office space further away into the basement where where nobody uses that, that play space and make the den a play space. And like, oh my God, was that... That was my wife's idea. She gets 100% credit for thinking of that. Um, but it means we have distance. But I also, like, I'm sitting here talking to you, and behind me is my bookshelf and my desk. But in front of me is an indoor tent. <laughs> <laughs> and one of those little, like, caterpillar tubes that you can crawl through that's attached to the tent and all sorts of toys. and Because half the basement is workspace and half the basement is play space. Yeah, and I moved about a year before the pandemic. I moved up into the attic of our house, which is not really not really coded for for human habitation <laughs> like my you know my ceiling is very low and there's one tiny little window so yeah it's a little bit of a fire hazard but i've got a ladder if i need it <laughs> but we've got the playstation mm. for the kids it's like over there and so like they can play with headphones on and then the, like, the lego corner is sort of over there yeah. but it's also because it's carpeted and there's just a lot of soft stuff up here. This is sort of the best sound space. Like I can't hear what's going on downstairs. They can't hear me. I can have meetings. I can record podcasts. And so it was very serendipitous that I had done that. You know, when we think about organization, we think about writing, there's a lot of sense that, you know, things have to be perfect. Like you have one system that like you stick with and like, that's how you do it. I haven't even said, I'm a, I haven't even said yet that I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> You know, for me, certainly adjusting to the pandemic has realized just how constantly I am adapting these systems and that that's okay. Like, yeah. I have to say at this point that it has occurred to me, 
um, for a whole variety of reasons. Dear God, I miss my coffee shop as a workspace, as a social space, right? It was, it's in a, a there's a couple of other faculty who um, live in the same neighborhood ish. And so they go to the same coffee shops. So you'd run, in, I run into them, you know, and I haven't been there in a year. <laughs> and it was just, there were certain kinds of work that it was like nice to be in that. Also, they have nice, um, they have nice pastries. <laughs> I do very much like my little strange attic <laughs> fire hazard that it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I like my little basement. It's yeah, it's a nice little setup. It'll be interesting to see if when things start to open up more, what of these systems that we've developed, you know, sort of the time blocking strategies that you're talking about. And I think we always are having to coordinate, especially, you know, we both have three kids and there's just always going to be that yeah. churn. And we have many and... fewer activities right now. <laughs> yeah. Everything feels more <laughs> hectic and yet so many things have been canceled or postponed. Yeah, the to-do list, it just changes. Yeah. You know, it's always going to be there. It's just the items on it in these scenarios become different things that you might not have always expected. Yes. But so it sounds like you're, you've are you become more deliberate in how you structure your time. Yeah, and some of that, I, I will be honest for your viewers and listeners, has really only clicked in in the last couple of weeks as a like feeling like a solid strategy. It took a lot of wandering around in the desert, but... Yeah, and I think that does... It does help explain a lot of the mental fatigue yeah. that people are feeling because, I, you know, I think everybody, not only are dealing with a pandemic and, you know, the, the crisis and the tragedy of all of that, it is then also just this kind of constant reshifting and in schools, you know, situations changing yeah. and schedules changing and, you know, having to adjust if there is an outbreak or... You know, so that constant kind of renegotiation. Yeah. Making everything available. deliberate. Um, yeah, the best analogy I can come up with is actually from teaching is thinking, trying to think about why Zoom is so much more exhausting for me than teaching in person. And it's even simple things like when I ask, are there, if I'm in a classroom and I say, are there any questions? Like I can look around and in about half a second, I can see on the faces of the students whether there's mass confusion or whether there are questions. And this... I now have to sit very intently watching the chat box <laughs> to see if anybody's mm -hmm. typing and not speaking, looking for hands. Some of the students have video on, some of them, right? Like I need to, just even something as simple as do you have any questions becomes this much more deliberate energy burning activity that, right, in the classroom, and I'm sure it's this way for you too, right? It's just secondhand. You don't even think about what you're doing when you do stuff like that. Um, but everything requires sort of active labor and div and dividing of attention yeah. you know that we have these play spaces next to our work areas that even if we're kind of you know we got a deadline we've got to do the reading we're in a work mode yeah there is that little piece that's always there or even if you know my kids are downstairs with my spouse it's i still know that they're here oh, yeah. and that something happened that like needs my attention that it's just I guess it's, um, what is it? Um, I can't remember the author's name, Cal Newport. I might be saying his name wrong. Um, I'll look it up and put it in the show notes, <laughs> that idea of deep work. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those those moments for deep work have vanished yeah. for us. And that's, yeah. My, my dirty little secret is the writing is the thing that's sort of vanished. The research projects that I've got going, I've been able to do some like primary source reading, some background reading some note taking, but like actually sitting down and writing paragraphs has just been the hardest. Yeah. I've had to do that now, um, for a couple new chapters because up until this point, I've just been kind of editing and re-editing mm -hmm. pieces, which actually felt very good in the middle of this. Cause it felt like I was doing something yeah. and I had ideas to work with and kind of shape, but now I'm at the point where like, I have to form the, writing the, is the thing that has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I have to organize the research and get it onto the page. And I found it like, it is very mentally draining having these ideas that I need to be out there. Like they're just sort of sitting in my head, kind of churning around. And just the fact, like writing it is hard, right? That That is a drain and finding that time is hard. But the just the fact of not writing it also becomes it, yeah, kind of weighs draining. on you. Yeah, I definitely have that. <laughs> But maybe, you know, when the kids all go back to school, we'll just have words pouring out of us. <laughs> After three days of napping, yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe three months. We'll see. <laughs> so 
I'll switch to segment three now, which is what's a secret that you can share to an organized scholarly life? You know, back when you were writing or you know, now <laughs> in pandemic times. Um, so the one the one thing I, I was thinking about this question, um, I think I give credit to my graduate advisor for not giving the advice in this way, but she always asks questions this way. But if you have a deadline, either self-imposed or external, to work backwards from the deadline, and that's something... I do a lot with my my students sort of look at me of like, why are we doing it this way? And I was like, well, because you only have 15 weeks to do this whole research paper. So you can only do bite off a piece that'll work for you to read things for six weeks because then you got to read them and, and write about them. So it doesn't always work in practice for me of like actually remembering to do it or think through it systematically. I, like a lot of people, end up a week before a deadline going, oh, shoot, <laughs> I was supposed to be at X place. And, you know, I've only written three pages and it's this 25 page thing that's got to go out when it works working backwards and saying okay this is kind of if i'm going to be submitting something on may 1st i have to be at xyz points and sort of using that as benchmarks i don't know maybe that's not a secret mm -hmm. but um and this is something i have actually started working this into my classes to show students how to reverse engineer their semesters like to take a syllabus and like work backwards from each of their deadlines and schedule in different tasks into their calendars because it was one of those things that like I was doing and I didn't even really realize that this was a system that I was using and like sometimes for me it is just word counts so I had an encyclopedia article due in March that I took the deadline I took the word count and I just divided it by the number of days I had <laughs> and just said I need to do x number of words yeah and I just wrote out like how many sessions of I think it ended up being like sessions of 370 words that I needed to do every weekday until the deadline. And like all of a sudden that was like totally doable. And, you know, by the time I got to, I think it was, and like I worked in time for like editing and proofreading, right. you know, by the time I got to the deadline, I had probably 1200 more words than I needed. So I had the space to kind of, you know, trim it down yeah. to the essentials. And just by having those small doable tasks broken down, it makes, it made it so much easier because it was something that was, it was pretty technical of a piece. And like, you know, I didn't, I didn't really bring the joy, let's say. <laughs> so it, especially if it's something that feels hard, I think it's, it's particularly useful to do it that way. Did you do it with your book? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's harder to do with a book just because a, a book is so big or i found it hard to do of the like this deadline is two years off and so blocking out what i'm supposed to do today is really challenging um even knowing that like this piece of research or writing goes into a chapter that's a smaller chunk i've started doing that with my second project now that's um that's helping but again i'm in a stage where like i just need to be reading stuff at the moment and so that it feels like progress it is progress like it, it's good enough for the moment but um I also this semester have an earned course release from doing independent studies and like advising theses. I guess the other secret is when you get some, if you get something like that, if you ever have that kind of like earned time, I've just been blocking off little bits of time. Like this is my research time. I would be working on this class that I'm not teaching. And so I need to, and it's early in the semester. So other stuff isn't coming up yet. So mm -hmm. come back to me in six weeks and see what happens, whether I'm still doing it once I've got a pile of papers. But, um, but yeah, that's helping too. Is just saying like, no, you need to stop for half an hour and do this other stuff. I find scheduling reading to be the hardest. Like I can, you know, it's like if I've got a deadline for writing, you know, I can, I can reverse engineer a writing deadline just like that. Like, okay. And I, I got my tasks, like I can break it down. That's fine. It's more of that brain work piece mm. of, because you know that reading is important, right? Reading informs the projects. You're in conversation with the with this literature but actually scheduling that and like being systematic about reading is my biggest challenge do you like have a list of books that you need to read like how do you kind of go about working that into your workflow so i use um a to-do list app called workflowy to keep track of what work and like teaching work and also make the grocery list and right like everything is on there and so i have I try to keep a list of the things I need to read for a particular project. Um, I mean, it's much easier to, to do it when it's for a particular. There's somewhere on a shelf lower down here, there's a set of journals of like, there's something in each of this, these journals that I would find interesting, but I might retire before I get to them because 
<laughs> because when am I going to have time to read something that's interesting and, and not with a specific purpose? But, um, right, like if I have a list of I need to read these five articles to be able to think through this problem on an essay I'm working on that I can sort of keep track of. And the way Workflowy works, you can add, it just uses hashtags, basically. So the thing I'm less good about is hashtagging which project things go with. That's a little haphazard. Um, the thing I've gotten mm -hmm. a lot better on over the couple of years I've used it is hashtagging dates. So I've actually, this will be a little bit of bragging, but I actually did do it. I've gone through and like plotted out the class reading for the whole semester, right? Because if I know on Tuesday, I'm going to do the reading for Wednesday. Like I know in April what I'm reading on Tuesday, April 20th or whatever it is for Wednesday's mm -hmm. class. And so I've already just got that with the date set up um, that when I get to that date in the calendar, I just, I don't need to think about it, which is, I mean, that may be the other secret is like, the less I have to think about things, the better I tend to do at actually doing stuff. Um, yeah, and automating those types and of automating reminders. stuff. So that was, I actually was going to ask you a question of one of the things that trips me up is when I do make a plan and then I miss a day for whatever reason, right? Like when you've got that 370 words a day, like what, are you just that good that you get that many words a day? No. No matter what. So what, what do you, how do you get no. back on track? So, I mean, word count, it's easy. I just divide it in three and add them to the next three sessions. Okay. So that, you know, whatever it is goes to 400 and whatever yeah, the math yeah. is you know, for the next day. So it's a little bit more. We're historians, not mathematicians. It works out. We've <laughs> got calculators. You know, so word count is easy or, or I try to get ahead and things. And like, I feel like, like I'm somebody who needs lots of small wins to keep me going. Yeah, me too. And. So like if I can work a little bit ahead, I'm like, yeah. And so that I, I end up like building in that flex time for myself. Like, you know, if a kid gets sick and, you know, so I'm always kind of working with that fail safe in mind, um, which probably sounds a little neurotic now that I'm saying it out loud, but the whole it's, podcast uh, is neurotic, Kate. The... <laughs> <laughs> and I say that as a neurotic myself, that's... <laughs> Um, but it is, you know, and sometimes stuff has to change, like, like a class schedule, like I've got to do, you know, I have a couple of, um, fail safe class models mm -hmm. of like, okay, like today, you know, we're, we're gonna, you know, catch up on this reading next time. We're going to combine these two readings next time. And today we're going to do a workshop on your paper. And, you know, so I've got like a paper workshop model. Mm -hmm ready to go if i need it, need it yeah. um you know if if crazy stuff happens because crazy stuff sometimes does happen um and you, and you have to be there to kind of to flex with it when it comes to like my my writing though it is sort of funny how i just kind of rely on the serendipity of like i'll hit a chapter and maybe it'll just go a little easier like because i'm in that mode right now where you know, I have backwards planned from my June submission date, basically a chapter a month, you know, so this month though, I had two chapters scheduled, but it turns out that one of them that I was going to be working on was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was an eight out of 10 is how I ranked it. That was nice, nice planning to put a good chapter next, next to what, the know, month we wanted to, out. especially since you put two chapters in the shortest month. I know I, I well, I was, I, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking, <laughs> but it, luckily I am now working into my March plan on two chapters that need to be drafted. So, you know, I do rely on a lot of that serendipity. And I think just having those those backup plans so that you can move things around, you know, if I need to take, I'm somebody who can't, I can't work on in at after 6 p.m. Mm. It's very hard for me to work at night. Never, even in college, like people were pulling all-nighters. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, gotta go to bed, guys. <laughs> So like, I know that about myself. And so I needed to, I need to like, make sure I have a plan in place for, for those fail safes. Yeah. Yeah. I have the struggle I, I have is that five, basically 5 PM to 9 PM is off limits. Yeah. And if I do, I can sometimes do an extra hour of work in the evening, but sometimes right. Five to nine is dinner. I'm trying to get people to eat dinner, which is not always a... constant fighting, constant yes. fighting. Um, sometimes bath night, clean up, right? Getting the, the, my girls are young enough that they need to be gotten to bed. They can't just be sent off, um, you know, and then dishes and all the other stuff. And then it's nine, nine thirty, And it's like, yeah, I still have an hour of work to do, but 
where am I going to find the energy to do that? I, I just can't function by that point. It's just easier for me just to go to bed. And I, it's not like I wake up and like, oh, like 5.30 a.m. I'll get an hour of work done. I'm not that person either. So I have to be like very deliberate, like during these hours yeah. of the day when I can work. I've tried doing wow. that. And with, with the theory of like, oh, I'll get up at 5.30. I'll get an hour working before the kids wake up. Guaranteed they hear the alarm. Yeah, it's good to know that, you know, we, all have, we have company and that flexibility can be a trap, but it can also save our butts. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, the, it's great that it's flexible, but it's also like, I can do my work at 11 o'clock at night, which sometimes means I feel like I need to do my work at 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That constant pressure to produce and, and keep going. And, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just to, just to get through. But, um, well, thank you, Joe. Thank you. For taking time out of your work time to come and talk organization and, you know, just to commiserate a little feels, yeah. feels really good. Yes. It always feels good to have sympathetic ears and, <laughs> and hear that we're all going through the same thing. Yeah. So thank you again. Thank you.